Well, for the benefit of everyone in the room as well as worldwide, I think it's only appropriate that we go back to the history of human diet. And by doing so, it may reveal how far we've estranged ourselves from the origins of what our ancestors lived like and ate. I do a three-hour presentation. It will not be part of this, on this. And I go right back to the valley in Ethiopia that humans came from. We actually know that now. Uh, there is no debate on this in the legitimate corridors of anthropology or science. And we now, because of DNA testing, RNA testing, know what tracks our ancestors took out of Ethiopia and where they went. And many of you sitting in this room, as, as I look at you, as well as worldwide listening to us now, uh, some of your families were not that smart. They left the garden, everything was available, all the food we wanted, it was sunny, it was warm, it was perfect, and we just couldn't let it be the way it was. So we started to wander. And that's called nomadic. We became nomadic. And this is a little commentary on the fact as uh, Abraham Lincoln, one of our great presidents in this country, uh, commented 150 years ago when he said, all people are created equal. Well, we are those people that came out of the Ethiopian Valley. And why I'm white and not black is because my ancestors, not so smart, chose to live in God-forsaken cold weather. And my skin, and white people's skin, basically had to get thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner so that we could absorb the little bit of sun that we exposed ourselves to. And the further north you go, my lovely wife from Sweden, when I go there, even in the middle of winter, I have to wear sunglasses because everyone's so white, it's shining white. <laughs> they have like the thinnest skin of anyone, you see. Now, in this process, we had to put some humor into it. People started to have problems. You know, when you were in Africa, you know, you could pretty much pluck the food from the trees and take the plant from the ground, and nobody had cook stoves, and nobody had restaurants or menus or the internet to order something to your house, that they pretty much ate in a very interesting way. They only ate when they were hungry, which is really a bizarre thought for most of us today. You actually have been conned into believing that you need breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or you're going to starve to death. Where the prevailing science since 1933 tells us that our body still, because our bodies evolved over God knows how many thousands and thousands of years, want high quality food, nutritious food, in very small amounts. It doesn't need breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you're not going to starve if you don't have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So these are scientific facts we know now. There's been 1,688 studies done that basically look at who lives the longest, who has the least disease. It's people who eat the highest nutritious food, which we're going to expose today, in the smallest amounts. Not really a lot of nutrition all of the time. So even a lot of nutrition all of the time isn't as healthy for you as a lot of nutrition periodically. Today, by the way, as I'm speaking to you, this is one of my fast days. I've been fasting this way for 44 years. And so now we go back to that wandering group of people. Now, I'm committed to a healthy plant-based diet because after four and a half decades of working with 265,000 people and watching what happens, both when I was directing centers in Europe as well as here in the United States, watching what happens when you put people on particular types of diets and using the best of mainstream science and the best of futuristic cutting-edge science. Mainstream science is sort of antiquated at this point. So we combine both. And what we have found is that plant-based diets are not questionably what to eat, nor are your body blood types going to make a difference, or that you have a paleo type of diet. That's all nonsense and propaganda. It is not real science. It's quasi-science at best. But all of us have a particular need for food. And when we look at where nutrition comes from, it comes from plants. Now let me, in a very, very simple and clear way, explain how it works. 
You have this wonderful star that is up in the sky called the sun. Matter of fact, this state, we are blessed by a lot of sun. That's why I moved the institute from Boston after 30 years here to sunny Florida for the last 30 years. And from the sun, projectiles out, protons that in the atmosphere of space become photons. Light, light. And what evolved on this planet to capture the energy from the sun so all life can occur is green, leafy plants. Isn't that amazing? That this is the perfection, the orchestration, the symphony of nature that nobody talks about in the magnificent way that I've had the privilege to get to look at it. So again, the sun which creates life on this planet, created you. All of you sitting here in the room and listening worldwide, you are here because of the sun. And these protons are converted in the atmosphere to photons and are captured on green leafy plants or the origin of life. This is not questionable. We are now talking about legitimate biology, legitimate science. So where does all protein come from? The word proton and protein sound very familiar, does it not? You may or may not know that this year at the Olympics, the strongest man we ever sent to the Olympics won the bronze medal because he eats plants not because he eats the carcasses of dead animals or the milk from another species. One of the books, many books I've written, is called Dairy Deception, and when I'm making that presentation, I actually found photographs of people dressed like me, men and women in beautiful business garb, underneath a cow suckling from its breast. And as I show that in the audiences worldwide, there's gasps and awes and everyone says, that sounds and seems almost pornographic, but you've been doing it your whole life. You've been conned into believing that. That that's a natural thing to do. It's not a natural thing to do. And I was caught up into that because my mom and dad went along with the program, loving, wonderful people. My grandparents went along with the program. And the program actually began in the beginning of the 20th century when they started to market food. Remember, there was no food markets of any significance, except little villages and maybe the farmer would come down and, and, and put their fruits and vegetables out until the 20th century. And when the population burgeoned, when we started to grow from hundreds of thousands to millions and now into billions of people, and some sinister folks started to say, how do we make a lot of money feeding people? And there's one thing, no matter how bad the economy is in the world, the one part of it that never goes down is food because we can't stop eating. They said, let's find ways to categorically put these into little processes. And they created factory farms. And they created distribution centers. And they had to recognize immediately that they couldn't make food like the human body was built for because you cannot put a raw food inside of a package because it rots. It rots, it decays. You can't ship a raw food. In a day or two, it's gone. Now, another interesting fact in this whole process is we came from the origins of a raw food diet. Your ancestors were not interested in cook stoves or kitchens or what color the cabinets were. Not at all. They didn't have any interest in that. They had an interest in, I have just walked 20, 30, 40 miles. I am hungry. What's available in this geographic location? And let me pluck the food from the trees and the earth. Now, anyone that would doubt or question this, you lack something that most people lack called common sense. Common sense. But I can tell you one thing, as committed as I am to a plant-based diet, I'm the father of four, and if I happen to be one of the tribes that were stupid enough to move to the far northern regions of the world, and it was January and there were snowstorms and my babies were starving, I may start to do something very odd, like slaughter animals and eat them. So where did this begin? Right there. We went into geographic locations that were not friendly, that didn't provide food, 
And starvation was a very real reality, and we had no other choice but to slaughter animals. And, you know, if you had average intelligence, you would look over and basically say, hey, wait a minute, that animal over there is not dead, that wolf's not dead, so wolf's a natural carnivore. You're not a carnivore. No matter how hard they try to tell you you're omnivores or carnivores, you are not. There is no biological indication in one morsel of science anywhere on the planet Earth that points to you being a carnivore. But there is going to be overwhelming data that I just give you the tip of the iceberg that shows you what happens when you pretend or try to be a carnivore in a body that is an herbivorous, a frugivorous body. I can show you that. But I may have, my family may have done that. Now the other fact that most of you don't know, because many of us in the developed, developed is a polite way of saying rich countries. You ever notice that? So developed countries, the one that I'm in, the richest of all the developed countries, we sort of become very colloquial. You know, we sort of have a very small reality. We think everyone in the world is exactly like us and everyone should be like us and you know, we're like the epitome, the cherry on the wheatgrass cake. And the truth of the matter is, the world doesn't work like this. Not everyone eats meat and dairy. Not everyone drives their car through fast food restaurants or when they're pumping gas, go to the convenience store to get their dinner. Boy, when did that start happening? They knew we were so lazy, we wouldn't even go to fast food restaurants. We had to get gas, and we're hungry, we get gas, ooh, ooh, let's go get something. So we get a beef jerky, and we eat it. Sometimes when I speak, it's unpleasant, because this may relate to your life, as it did my life sometimes, in the past. So bottom line is, six out of ten people on the earth today, out of the seven and a half billion people alive today, Six out of ten people on earth primarily are plant-based eaters. So the minority, the minority is carnivorous food consumption. How about that? So don't be so colloquial in Europe and North America and in Asia. Don't look at all the cowboy movies that America exports and think, you have to eat like a cowboy because cowboys get sick. So our exploration today will be in two areas. Number one, that we have lived in an abnormal way, thinking it's quite normal for a very long period of time. The end result is devastating illness and economic collapse. The total destruction of the planet Earth. Period. Now, this is not melodramatic. These are factual statements. On this stage, during this 10-day program, one thing I can promise you, is that you have the world's leading authorities who are not shy to tell you the truth that are much more endowed in some of these subjects than I am in lifestyle that will prove to you scientifically that we are destroying the earth by making idiotic choices like using 50 acres to create a cow so we can eat a cow rather than feeding tens of thousands of people out of 50 acres. Is that a surprise? Where does all life come from? The sun. Where is it captured on a green leafy plant? Every other creature on Earth, 100% of creatures on the planet Earth, eat a 100% raw food diet. Except the poor domestic animals that we force to eat cooked food, and we, the one idiotic species that choose to eat cooked food. So in summation, most of the people on the planet today are plant-based eaters. 100% of species, other than the human species, in nature, choose to eat a 100% raw food diet. Hippocrates Health Institute for 60 years has put the sickest people on raw food, plant-based diets and followed them for years and decades, and the end result is people stay young and vital, as I have, and people are able to reverse catastrophic disease in thousands of cases, and most important, before you get sick, is prevent the darn thing. We all think, oh, it's inevitable, we're going to get sick, and maybe there's a magic pill that will make us better. How about the inevitability, we're going to have fun, and we're going to be laughing until the day we die at 100? Oh, well, that's not in our mindset. The mindset is already programmed to say death, disease, dying. It's always been like this. Let's be moderate. It's not time to be moderate. 
We are in an extreme circumstance with people dying every single day unnecessarily. People suffering because, as always, the human race fixes the problem after they've created the problem rather than prevent the problem by doing the right thing. And I'll repeat it again. As always, we wait until we have a problem. Then we try to find inventive ways to fix the problem. I am giving you the resolution of fixing the biggest problem on the planet Earth today, the destruction of the Earth and the destruction of human life and health. And if you choose to listen to what I say and not shut down as I would have 46 years ago sitting here listening to me, I would have shut down big. I would have said, that guy's a lunatic, he's an extremist. Because I didn't want to change, but if you choose to listen to me and join the army of love, you will now be doing something in your life that's the most important thing that a human can do today. Heal yourself, and by healing yourself, heal the planet Earth.